Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm very happy to be here today uh, to talk to you about uh, uh, political philosophy of Hans Hoppe. But I must confess that uh, I do so with some anxiety because I'm afraid that if I don't uh, get things right, I might be physically removed from the Mises <laughs> Institute. Uh, first, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Hans Hoppe's background because I think this is will give you a way, a clue to understanding uh, where he's coming from, and it might will help you in understanding the context of some of his arguments. Uh, Hans was born in West Germany in. Uh, Saxony in 1949, uh, and he attended his, he got his undergraduate degree from the University of Bazaarland. Then he did his graduate work at the uh, Goethe University, which is in Frankfurt. Now this is, was considered one of the, the, the liberal or the left wing university of the various German universities. And in fact, his major professor under whom he got his doctorate and then also his higher doctorate, which is called a habilitation in German, was Jürgen Habermas, whom I imagine a good many of you will have heard. Uh, Habermas was a leading member of the Frankfurt School, which was a group of Marxists with uh, rather uh, original views on Marxism. They were particularly interested in applying Marxism to uh, culture, and uh, they produced a number of controversial and influential studies. Uh, in that area. And Habermas, as I say, although a, somewhat of a dissident Marxist, was a Marxist. And when Hans was his student, he was at first, although he was never a Marxist, he was favorable to a, a, a democratic socialism. He was he was in the uh, he, the generation of students of 1968, the famous, which uh, was famous uh, re student revolts all over Western Europe. So he was one of that group. But after he uh, had been held those views for a while. He first started to read Friedrich Hayek and then later Ludwig von Mises and Murray Rothbard. And after that, he became, he changed his political views much to the dismay of Jürgen Habermas. Uh, he had been one of Habermas's favorite students, but after he switched his political views, they were no longer close because although Habermas is, has, uh, was no, no longer in favor of a Marxist revolution, he's always maintained his hatred of the free market. So it was not very likely that they be uh, continued on a close relationship. Uh, Hans came to the United States to study with Murray Rothbard. Rothbard was then teaching at Brooklyn Polytechnic, and he, Hans, uh, sat in on all his classes. And then uh, when Rothbard offered, was offered a position at the uh, University of Nevada, Las Vegas, Hoppe joined him and became professor of economics there. And uh, for a number of years, with the two of them in 
uh, that department in in Las Vegas, that was, I should say, the leading center in the United States for the study of uh, Austrian economics of a Rothbardian sort. And uh, Hans continued uh, his to be a professor at the University of UNLV for a number of years, but he since he retired and he's now living in Turkey. And in uh, 2006, he started the uh, Property and Freedom Society. In he believed that the Mont Pelerin Society had made undue concessions to government intervention that it wasn't a genuinely free market organization anymore. It was too much of a compromising group. And one thing about Hans, if you know him, uh, he would have adopted uh, for himself the, the, the line from uh, the main character in Ibsen's play Brand, the devil is compromise. Uh, I would Hans is the leading successor to Murray Rothbard in political philosophy, and he's made major contributions in a number of areas. And what I'd like to do uh, this afternoon is discuss three of these uh, argumentation ethics, the criticism of democracy, and the theory of social evolution. Uh, depending on the time, I don't, well, I'm not sure I'll be able to get to all of these, but I'll try. I'm, uh, the one that interests me the most is argumentation ethics, but I won't spend all the time on that unless I get carried away, which sometimes happens. Uh, that can be carried away, can be taken in two senses there. Uh, now, uh, an idea that uh, Hans has, which is quite similar to that of Murray Rothbard, is that he says conflict, and Mises has this view also, that conflicts between people over resources arise because of scarcity, because the economic goods are not super abundant, uh, it can happen that people want to use the same resource. So in order to resolve these conflicts, <clears throat> we need rules that assign control of each resource to one person so there won't be any fights about it or for our fights. <clears throat> they can be settled according to the agreement. And he takes the further view, which also comes from Rothbard, that all rights are property rights, so that if we can settle who owns the various resources, then we've resolved all questions of rights. Uh, now, if that's the case, we want to get the rules to settle these conflicts, how do we come up with the rules? And here, Hans <coughs> developed argumentation ethics uh, from the work of Jürgen Habermas, who was his teacher, and also another very influential German philosopher, Karl Otto Oppel. I should say that when we're talking about argumentation ethics, this is not something that Hans invented. This is an idea he took over from Habermas and especially Karl Otto Oppel. But what his contribution, his original contribution, was to take argumentation ethics in a libertarian direction, in an anarcho-capitalist direction. And this is something uh, neither Habermas nor Oppel would have approved of. 
uh, now he, uh, if, according to argumentation ethics, uh, if we're, we're trying to establish what are the correct rules, what are the rules that we ought to have to resolve disputes, so we must be able to support these rules through argument. Uh, if somebody says, <coughs> this is the right rule, and somebody says, no, it isn't, uh, we ought to be able to give reasons that uh, this the rule we suggest is the correct one. And uh, one point Hans raises in this connection, he says, you can't argue that you can't ar argue, and he at least, well, if at least it would be very difficult to argue that you can't argue, even if you could, which if he's right, you can't. But <laughs> that, uh, 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 as I'll explain in shortly, I think this, there's quite a bit of plausibility in this starting point, the starting point being that if we need to support what we're saying by argument, we should uh, use the conditions, we sh should ask, what are the conditions for having a rational discussion with somebody? And those conditions would, if we can say what those are, <clears throat> those should tell us what the rights are that people have. Now, to one criticism that's sometimes uh, raised at this point, I think rests on a misunderstanding, or at least uh, people have not grasped the structure of the argument. Uh, supposing we can show that a discussion, uh, in order to have a, a rational discussion with someone, we need to recognize certain rules of procedure during the discussion. Some people have objected. Uh, why doesn't that show only that people have these rights during the process of discussion, but not outside the discussion? As soon as they stop talking, maybe they lose their rights. Sometimes we can push, some people have pushed this objection even further, saying, well, maybe these discussion, have, being discussion just shows you have rights over your vocal cords, or I won't go into that because it's obviously an absurd claim to make. I mean, when, when somebody's that stupid, there's no point in <laughs> arguing with them, <laughs> even if, you can't argue that you can't argue. At least there's some, some cases where you have, might have to make an exception. <laughs> uh, so uh, what I think people are missing is that the argument is, goes, says, well, once you've established what the conditions are for rational discussion, there's the additional premise that those conditions should be the ones that hold generally. So it's the, the view is that in order to, the rights people have in all circumstances <coughs> are the rights we have to postulate for people to engage in rational discussion. Uh, so uh, one point I hope will uh, motivate this line of thought, perhaps make it plausible, would, I didn't put this on my PowerPoint because it's just something that i had been thinking of uh, quite recently, that uh, we can appeal to a notion from the great philosopher H.P. Uh, Grice, who wrote about what's called implicatures, and these aren't strict logical implications of something, but they're uh, 
under, there's something that's understood from the context. Uh, for example, supposing you go into McDonald's and order a hamburger, and then the person brings out a hamburger, but it's encased in cement, uh, it would be an implicature that when you order a hamburger, you have in mind a hamburger that you can eat. And this wouldn't qualify. Another one would, another example of an implicature would be uh, supposing you're taking a walk and you see someone standing by his car and the person says to you, uh, I've just run out of gas. Uh, is there a gasoline station near here? And you say, uh, yes, there's one just around the block. It would be an implicature, although not strictly impl logically implied by what you said, that you believe the gas station around the corner has gasoline for sale, supposing you thought you, you were aware that the station had run out of gas. So it wouldn't be, it wouldn't fit the context of a conversation if the person says, is there a gasoline station around here to answer, yes, there is, even though what you, what, uh, you would be saying would be true because in that context, what was meant was a gasoline station where gas is available. So the application here, <clears throat> I think, to the conditions for argument uh, is that if we're engaged in an argument with someone, the implicature, the presupposition, is that we're renouncing force. So if I am ask you for your reasons or you ask me for my reasons, we're, although it's not logically implied by asking for reasons, we're, uh, in, we're in, uh, having the implicit presupposition that we won't use force. And this, I think, is a quite plausible idea. So this is the standpoint of argumentation ethics in, as developed by Habermas and Oppel. And now we have to ask, what is about Hans's innovation? Is that his innovation was to take, as I say, to take argumentation ethics in an a narco-capitalist direction. So he, he says his, in his answer to what are the conditions for argument is different from that of Habermas and Apple. He says, in order to argue, you must own yourself. And if you deny that, that involves what he calls a performative contradiction. Uh, this, well, I'm, uh, I'm glad he called it that because that gives me a chance to go into all sorts of interesting material about what the difference is between a performative contradiction and a straightforward logical contradiction is. I'm sure you'll all be fascinated to find out about this. Uh, supposing uh, I uh, supposing I say uh, I've never in my life spoken an English sentence, making that statement in English, uh, my making the statement sh would show that the statement is false. So that would be an example of a performative contradiction. Your, your, the very fact, the, your very making the statement shows its falsity. You wouldn't be able to make the statement you did unless your 
statement was false. Uh, for example, another example, suppose I said, uh, I am now <clears throat> completely unconscious. If that were true, I wouldn't be able to say I am completely unconscious. So my making the statement shows the statement is false. Now, that has to be very distinguished from a logical contradiction. Uh, and I, I should say for some of you, uh, those of you who are planning to uh, take the final exam, if you make it to the final stage, that's, this is sometimes a question I ask. Many, pe <clears throat> many people have missed this, so if you're planning to get into the final, this would be something to take note of. Uh, suppose I say uh, two, 2 plus 2 equals 5. Uh, that's logically contradictory. It's uh, a priori true that 2 plus 2 equals 4. But by saying 2 plus 2 equals 5, doesn't my saying 2 plus 2 equals 5 doesn't show that 2 plus 2 equals 4. It isn't the case that I could say 2 plus 2 equals 5 only if 2 plus 2 equals 4. So it's a quite different concept. And uh, so that I've given an example there where something is... Uh, logically a priori true, 2 plus 2 equals 4, but denying it doesn't involve you in a performative contradiction. Uh, this works the other way. Also, we can have something that is a performative contradiction, but isn't, uh, it doesn't involve any, uh, uh, is not a priori, the denial of what I've of the of what I've said is not a priori true. So, supposing I say uh, I've never spoken an English sentence in English, that's a form of contradiction. But the statement I've never spoken an English sentence is not a priori true. That's just something one would have to find out by seeing which languages I knew. Did I know English? That isn't something we would be able to know a priori just by thinking about. So there are two very different concepts. So to return from those uh, rather arcane, that rather arcane realm of epistemology to uh, political philosophy, Hans has said, uh, if you say you don't own yourself, this is a performative contradiction. So in addition to being uh, uh, showing that one needs to be a self-owner in order to engage in argument, he says we also have to own resources in order to argue. We must be able to at least have some place to stand on or sit down while we're arguing. So we need to have a rule for how we acquire resources. And Hans's argument there, he says, well, there are only two possible rules. One is that we can the first user resource acquires it, and the other is you could just own resources by claiming them, but if you could own a resource just by claiming it, he says, you would then be able to claim other people, but we've already established that each person owns himself, so that rule would lead to a contradiction, and you're left only with the first user rule. And remember, when we're talking about rules, these rules are universal, they hold, not just for individuals engaging in argument, 
but for everyone at all times. Uh, now, I want to go in on in the time remaining to the second uh, topic I want to discuss, which is uh, Hans's criticism of democracy. Uh, many people, although probably fewer in this room than in the general population, assume that democracy is a good thing. They would say, if someone questions democracy, they would say, isn't it better that people rule themselves rather than be subject to a dictatorship? And if we don't have a dictatorship, isn't it better to accept the results of a fair election rather than just uh, have people fight it out among themselves? What would be the alternative to a democracy? Uh, now, Hans rejects these pro-democracy argument. He does so in a book I hope many of you will read if you haven't done so already, called Democracy, the God that Failed. Now, the title of that is quite significant, The God that Failed, because in 1949, there was a very influential collection by six writers who had been uh, former members or sympathizers with the Communist Party called just the God that failed, and the God that failed was communism. So by using that title, Hans is intending to suggest that there is a parallel between democracy and communism in that an idea that was taken very seriously by intellectuals at one time is really not a good one and is fallacious. Uh, his fundamental objection to democracy is that it ignores rights. Uh, if people have rights of self-ownership and property through uh, acquisition by the first user, there's really no room for disputes about how to resolve conflicts. Uh, the only disputes would be on who has the property rights in question. So anyone who interferes with your property rights is guilty of aggression, including a majority voters. So uh, uh, supposing, say, uh, in a, we, there was an election and people said uh, they wanted to say you couldn't uh, how you couldn't establish certain businesses in your property. We're having zoning laws, and you must obey these, these laws. Even if the great majority of people voted for that, that wouldn't abolish your property right. You would still have the right to do what you wanted with your property rights, as long as you didn't violate the rights of others. Uh, he, Hans also, so Hans then is, rejects democracy, and in a very interesting way, he says that the anti-democracy argument can be used to support anarchism. And the way he argues for that is he says, a right that stems from self-ownership is your right to self-defense. That's a fundamental right. And this can't be given up even to a supposed minimal state that claims to be limited to protecting rights. Uh, in Hans's view, if you, get, if you said, well, we're going to have a, just a minimal state this will be limited to protection and justice, and uh, save a type favored by Robert Nozick in Anarchy State Utopia. 
Han said, well, there's no, once the state has control of the, all the uh, use of force in a, a particular society or nation, then there's no stopping point. It, there's no way to limit it because people have surrendered to it the right of self-defense. So he says, He's using, the, he says, even in a democratic state, you're still surrendering your right to self-defense, and this holds for any state, no matter how limited. Uh, uh, as you will see, uh, Hoppe's view of democracy is different from that of Mises. According to Mises, uh, He's in, Mises is in favor of political democracy, but he says that the free market is much more democratic than the political democracy because the consumers are always voting with their dollar votes. They're always deciding what's being produced. So Mises is really giving an argument from democracy to support for capitalism, which he calls mass production for the masses. And this differs very much from Hans Hoppe's rights-based approach. Uh, one argument that's gotten him into some difficulties, controversy, is he says that democratic politicians need to get majority support to gain power and stay in office. So what counts for them is what uh, will uh, get people to support them now, even if, as invariably happens, they're unable to fulfill their promises. That doesn't matter to them as long as they can stay on uh, through their term of office. And since in a democracy, the time, at least the... Uh, the chief executive is in power is generally limited. There won't be, the, the politicians won't care for the long run. But Hans contrasts this with monarchies, which he thinks tend to adopt a long run perspective. And by monarchy, he doesn't mean uh, monarchies the way some countries such as uh, United Kingdom or Norway or Sweden, Netherlands have them today, where the monarch is just the ceremonial head of state, although sometimes they have a good deal of influence. Hans has in mind a monarchy where the monarch has real power. Uh, now, in the short time remaining, I want to say a little bit about Hans's views of social evolution. Uh, he uses the two parts of, of his views that I've discussed so far, his theory of rights and his criticism of democracy, uh, to develop a whole theory of how society is involved. So he's engaging in what we call conjectural history that's to say he's using social theory in order to offer a rational reconstruction of history. And uh, the uh, account of the origin of money by uh, Karl Menger and Ludwig von Mises is an example of con conjectural history in which they said uh, because of certain facts about how money must develop, it would have to, in fact, about the nature of money, it would have to develop in a certain way. So Hans has a similar view of, of social evolution in general. And one uh, thing in Hans's account is different from many versions of social evolution, that they're very, tend to be very, optimistic. They'll say, well, we start off at a very low level, but then we're gradually getting better and better. There may be 
points that uh, were uh, times not gone so well, but the general trend is upwards. Uh, and people who say this say, well, history starts with a war of all against all, somewhat of a Hobbesian state of nature, but then absolute rule put an end to this, and then this was eventually replaced with democracy. So although Hans readily acknowledges and even insists on economic takeoff after the Industrial Revolution, his view of social evolution is downwards, not upwards. It's things have gotten worse. So in that respect, he was like uh, the famous gloomy dean of St. Paul's, uh, William Ralph Ng, who gave a famous lecture on progress and came out against it. Hans is of that school. Uh, Hans denies that history started off as a war of all against all. He says this is a falsehood defended by pro-state intellectuals. Instead, people naturally accepted the self-ownership and first appropriate, appropriator counts of rights. So these aren't made up theories, but he thinks these are a natural way people would have of looking at disputes. Uh, in settling disputes based on these principles, people would tend to gravitate to natural leaders or aristocrats, and feudalism developed from that. Uh, then over time, one aristocrat would tend to be, become stronger than others and become the king, but his power was strictly limited by the other nobles. Now, I'm sure you'd like to hear the rest of this, uh, how this continues into democracy going on, uh, and how, uh, how terrible that is. But uh, uh, fortunately, you don't, uh, at least, uh, uh, unfortunately, for those of you who would like to hear the rest of it, uh, I need to stop the lecture here because we're, we're going to have a five minute break now so uh, people can get, they, they can get ready for the faculty panel. So I'll conclude my lecture at this point. Thank you very much.